Frank Garcia was born and raised in San Antonio and he lived and worked in Houston for 41 years where he retired from the United Parcel Service. And he moved to Gillespie County in 2016 and is a Texas Master Naturalist. Frank has held several leadership roles in the Texas Master Naturalist Hill Country Chapter and he's an active volunteer. He's also a volunteer here at our UGRA Edgescape Pollinator Garden since 2019. And along with his fellow garden volunteers, they are an enormous help and resource to us at UGRA. So we get to see Frank about once a week, and we're, we're very thankful for that. So please join me to welcome Frank Garcia. Uh, my present, uh, presentation is going to be pretty short. It's going to cover some of the do's and don'ts of a garden that's not huge, it's maintainable, and you're going to be encountering some of the things that uh, you find here in the hill country, which is deer eating your plants, <laughs> okay? Uh, the deer will eat anything. There's no such thing as deer resistant plants. Uh, in my exposure to living here in the, uh, in the hill country for a, for a short time has proven and, and given me this insight that, that no matter what you do, they're gonna eat it, okay? <laughs> Once it starts growing, if you don't protect it, it's gone the next day, okay? Because deer have that little it's like people, that they, they got habits. They got a little routine, they got a little path. Okay, let's go, let's go to this buffet line. Okay, we're done here, let's go to that buffet line. Let's go over there. So with that in mind, I'll continue. So uh, the relationship that we have with the UGRA is a uh, exchange of services. They provide a facility for us to uh, you know, hold our meetings, chapter meetings, and we maintain their garden, okay, with uh, using, utilizing our knowledge uh, to give them insights for uh, if they have any questions that if I can't answer, I know where to get the answers from as well. Uh, but um, it started back in uh, 2018, 2018, so it's about five years now, and when they first put in the little garden assignment, it was a bunch of Bermuda grass, okay? So a lot of people say, oh, Bermuda grass is bad. It's, well, it depends what you're looking for in, 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 in your grasses. Uh, I myself have Bermuda grass in some part of my, uh, my backyard, fenced in the backyard, uh, because I know I can cut it, and I know I don't, it, it, it just will kill anything else that comes up in it. So that's good. So I don't have to worry about watering it that often. But here, okay, the, we wanted to establish a, uh, a pollinator garden or as a, you know, as a, an example of what plants you can grow there you know, because it is an edgescape and the uh, UGRA wants to help the community uh, save water, uh, not over use the water. And so we plant local plants. So, we have uh, various project leaders that have uh, taken over. <clears throat> so when I first started coming here, it was in 2019. And uh, so, you know, they had already tried various options to remove the, the uh, Bermuda grass, and that was to solarize it, covering it up, putting mulch over it, newspaper. It, it's all great, but if Bermuda grass, if it's covered, it'll just go deeper, okay? And so yeah, you try to take it out, no, you're not gonna be successful. Because it takes a lot of work, and back and then, uh, let me see, so the, the early plantings that were there, the Bermuda grass. Okay, what you see here is after um, in year 2020, I went in there with the, with the, with the, with a new staff, and we started pulling the Bermuda grass from the root. We didn't just pull it from the top. We used some uh, uh, let's say tools to get to the root, and it took us almost a whole year just to to do this little section of garden to remove the uh, Bermuda grass. And it was a arduous task because, you know, volunteers come in, oh, you want to do what? Okay, so we, we did it. Uh, so by the end of 2020, we had uh, um, removed like 99.9% .9 of the Bermuda grass, okay? Uh, so then uh, we started seeing what plants were there that they had planted, some of them were Native, some were not. They were uh, uh, plants that were uh, that could tolerate this type of a terrain, this type of a soil, and everything else. And uh, we also looked at putting little cages. As as, as me, uh, I'm the top individual. I'll make anything work. So you see this little small cage. Well, oh, that's a make-do cage. All right. And so the spikes, well, the spikes are wood. 
All right. So there's a lot of things that you can do to help improve your garden. Uh, but uh, if we go here and then uh, we start getting more involved, even Ray Buck, the, uh, the uh, terrorist uh, predecessor, he was impressed that we were able to remove all the Bermuda grass. Okay. So uh, with that in mind, uh, we got new uh, new signage from the EGRA, and they gave us uh, the little presentation. So in the background, you see, oh. That's, that doesn't look like a lot of flowers, a lot of plants. Well, we knew that we, were, we, we had a task in front of us, so we were able to kind of start planning out what we had. You know, you'll see some lions here back there. They're not native, but they had planted something that was going to bloom, okay, something that would give uh, the, the people, the, the, the uh, community to come in and stop and look at what UGRA was offering. Uh, so it was some humble beginnings for the organization. Uh, and as well as uh, our efforts. So then when we started clearing out, uh, everything cleared out, then we started utilizing the cages. So we started with smaller cages and enclosures as a four foot, four foot welded wire, you know, whatever fencing we could uh, uh, utilize, we did that. We had an irrigation system, which was uh, already in place by the EGRA, so that helped. Uh, and so we, uh, the problem with small cages and the deer, like, like I mentioned earlier, the deer will access it. So if you put a round cage and the plants are coming out on, on the wire, the deer are gonna trim it. <laughs> it's like nice little, it's nice little round plant that you don't, ex, you don't expect it to be round, but it's gonna be round because the cage <laughs> will dictate that. And, and then on the middle one, you'll notice that it's, I, I, I put a half moon to protect it because it was against a wall. The backside is a drop side in the parking lot. So you were just reaching out and, and eating it. I said, what? what the? So it's okay, we, we can fix that. Uh, so then the, the other one, this cage over here, it was a make do like the other one you first saw a while ago. So I just put it in there and noticed that some of the stakes, the wooden stakes that I used as well, I'll just place it on there. Well, they didn't work because the traffic, cats, Whatever it happened to be in there, they push it over and they could get to the plant. Uh, the plant that I tried to save and it's still good is the passion flower. And the deer don't like passion flower. They don't touch it. That's, that always amazes me. Okay, so, uh, you know, so the biggest obstacle we, we faced was the deer coming into the garden and having a buffet with whatever they, that was available. So, uh, during... Um, in 2022, we uh, expanded the cages. By this time, we had done three or four phases of uh, creating cages around certain parts uh, of uh, plants that we had planted, and uh, mostly from uh, donations coming from master uh, uh, naturalists or NEPSA volunteers that would come in and, and uh, offer plants. And so, but an example here is that on the uh, Craig's blue mist flower, the tall one on the center was inside the cage. The one on the lower left was outside the cage. So they were probably growing no more than six inches and the deer were just chomping away. Camp okay, coming in, coming in, coming in. You had the Lyrian sage, which uh, inside the cage area as well. You have the flowers and they're blooming. We never, I, I never saw it until we put them inside the, the, the fence line. Then outside, and then outside the fence line, well, they were just barely get tall. Okay, so as I'm talking, I'm going to be giving you examples of what to do and what not to do, and hopefully it'll help you maintain a garden that you can have to, not have to worry about it. Because throughout this process that we're working uh, as a group to maintain the garden is we're not doing anything extra above and beyond. Okay, we're not amending the soil, we're not covering the ground. Uh, you know, it is what it is because it, it gives, I mean, uh, uh, I'm not a gardener, so I will make sure that what I have available to me, I'm going to utilize what's there. Uh, I understand how plants grow as a Texas master naturalist. I'm not an expert on anything. I'm, a, I'm a kind of a jack of all trades. Okay. So, um, in here, Again, so now this is what you, you get to see now. This spring, on the, on, the left side, on the right side, you'll notice that it's just green, right? You got all kinds of flowers, 
uh, you have the uh, lantana in, in uh, up front. You got the the cow on, on the on, on the right hand side of the right, and then inside the enclosure, you have, you have the uh, mint uh, lemon bee balm. You got the basket flower. You got ceniso. You got autumn sage. You got the Jerusalem sage, which is not a native, but you know we'll get rid. We're planning uh, to move it out of there so we can put more natives into that that caged-in area. And then on the left-hand side, you have the rosin weed, and so the rosin weed is does very well. So with uh, with the cages, the plants do grow, but uh, we're finding out that uh, in my short time frame, experiencing that the there are some plants that they won't uh, they won't touch. So we'll get to that in a, in a minute. And here, so before and after the fence, if you can see right here, this is on the, if you're walking out of this building and you face the street, all right, the garden's on the, on the right-hand side, all right? And on the right-hand side, it's like the sun, half a rectangle, and then it starts coming down as a triangle to uh, finish off the garden. Well, I had, uh, when we first uh, made the cages, we never included these uh, particular plants, on the far right hand, I'm trying to think of a pointer, but it's all right. On the far right hand, uh, you have the, uh, the red yucca, you got the gulf muley, and then a slower to the, the, the left hand side, there is a wafer ash. On that wafer ash, the deer will constantly, that one, oh, that one, thank you. Right there, thank you, Tara. Right here is, right here is where the wafer ash is at. And that thing never grew. You see the, you know, the blooms, the new leaves, the new foliage coming up. Next thing you know, because we would show up every once a week. No, they were gone the following week. So you wait another week, you're gone away. So we put in a fence uh, line and the fence around the area. And this is now what you see in the same area. And this is a year later. You got the wafer ash right here coming in, strong. We got the uh, red yucca over here. You got a fall aster over here that's growing finally, otherwise the deer would be eating it. We got the ceniso, or the Texas sage up here, the, the, the buckley uh, yucca. Now, deer don't touch it, touch it but you know, it's, uh, it's not being uh, trampled on or, or anything else. And then uh, we decided to add the uh, Texas star up here. Uh, and uh, we, in this uh, area, we also added some uh, pine muley within the fence area. How tall is your... It's uh, about four feet. That's it. And they don't jump over it? No, nah, because the deer have to have the deer have to have a, a, an open area to land on and jump out. So uh, you, you, yeah, I, I was taught that through an AT course that I took that the deer have a perception of what they can jump over. They know they can jump it, but what are they going to land on? Okay, it's got to be open space in order so they can, you know, come in. But when you're just starting, you don't have anything. Else. I know, yes. Uh, but what, what we did is, again, so to your point, when we started, the fences were a small area. And then as we started planting more, then we increased the fence line area. OK, make sense? Yeah. So when you saw those little round cages and people were there, I mean, I just, oh, they'll never get it. Yeah, well, they got it. They got the, the leaves that are around it, the flowers that come up through the sides. They were, that's what they were uh, eating. So with all these, you know, the fact that we took, we took the Bermuda grass out and now we had cages going up, now we had the plants that could uh, provide seed and have the next generation of flowers. In 2021, Gracie Wagner, she went out there and seeded the, uh, the garden. She just do. Okay, Frank, you throw some leaves out. Okay, I did. And so then um, in, in 2022, we started seeing these. Uh, and so there was a much more variety of plants that were in the fenced-in area compared to the previous years, because the previous years, all you would see were just the remnants of the larvae or the remnants of the uh, Craig's uh, uh, blue mist flower, stuff like that. So it wasn't something that, you know, at that point, it's like, well, why am I putting effort here when nothing's growing? So we had to put in the fence line. So uh, with the help with the UGRA, they provided some fencing, and so that helped, and so that was great. We appreciate that. 
So during, uh, during that time in, uh, in 2022, uh, in 2021, we, we had some blue bonded rosettes that were coming in around the area. Uh, but they weren't fenced in, so yeah, it, it, was, it was good food for the deer, okay? Uh, and then in last, last year, and even this year, uh, we were getting uh, things like the, uh, but, the buttercup, the blue bite, blue zest for blue meat, and then uh, this is the color. Uh, it's, it, it's amazing, it's just from my perspective, is that the work that I put in, it's not a whole lot, but it's a couple hours once a week with my partners who help me uh, maintain the garden. And you get results like this, and most people work day and night, or half a day, or you know, three times a week, whatever, to get those results. And the what we're trying to prove is it doesn't take a whole lot of effort with a a plan like was discussed earlier. You want to know what you have and what you want to accomplish with that piece of property, the real estate, so that you can be effective and not go out there and dread the fact that you did it because it's very easy to let go. I mean, think about the environment that we have this garden in. It's not controlled by a large fence. There are no animals. There's no, no, no one doing it on a daily basis or irrigation. The irrigation is based on whatever the city allows UGRA. The UGRA does follow the, uh, the watering uh, uh, constraints that they put on, on the citizens. So it is important that UGRA has and us, we can teach the, the community that it is possible to have a garden and not put a lot of effort, all right? Uh, the next one? So in the summer, we had some uh, flowers that were bloomed. We had Ceniso. Ceniso this year has bloomed like six times already, but we haven't had rain <laughs> those six times that they bloomed. So they, I guess they were expecting it to come in based on the time frame that, in between the flowering. Uh, but uh, again, I. I it's just hearsay. Uh, I'm not the expert on how, when, how Ceniso uh, uh, blooms. We had the, the basket flower, the American basket flower, and uh, the bee bomb in the background. But uh, inside that fenced area, we had to start pulling out some of the plants because there were just too many. Uh, and so, and the irrigation on the watering was not uh, more than normal. Uh, so uh, it, it is possible to maintain a, a green garden. And in the fall, uh, this, uh, we talked earlier about the uh, golf muley, and the golf muley here on the left-hand side, and that was before we had put up the fence. And this is the, the rosin wheat, and these are just flowers that uh, are utilized by the, by the butterflies uh, during the fall. And in 2020, last year, the next, uh, the, Nancy Huffman put in uh, in, in, in to help with the UGRA um, staff, and I forgot her name. Uh, Morgan. Oh, yeah, it's Morgan, yeah. They, they had applied for uh, a pollinated uh, monarchs grant, and they got it. So that's when we went in and we planted them in conjunction with the help from the uh, UGRA staff. And at that point, that was like our third time we encased now a bigger section of that garden to protect whatever we were going to plant because there was more natives and uh, people were kind of interested as well, how are we going to keep the natives from being destroyed by or decimated by the deer? So the, the milkweed, a lot of people, you know, now that I'm a master naturalist, everybody says, oh, we need milkweeds for the marks. So, okay, great. That's, that's fantastic. I appreciate that. Uh, uh, but the, the, the milkweed, the first year that we put it in, it, it did well, it didn't do great. It didn't put maybe one or two seed pods. And we had the, uh, the Texas milk, milkweed is this one here. And this is the Zizotis. And the Zizotis does well, uh, whether it's caged or not caged. Uh, we noticed that the, uh, the deer will maybe nibble it, but they will not eat it. Uh, I have some at my, at my place where I, uh, I live, and the deer do not touch it. Now, the Texas milkweed, they have not touched it. Even with the outside of the, the round circular fence that we have around it, uh, we also have some new little offsprings from the uh, the seeds on the Texas milkweed that's outside the fence line, and the deer have not touched that that plant one bit, uh, which is kind of amazing because uh, I would think they would they would touch it, but they haven't touched it. 
So then uh, we also have an extra plan, so we get the uh, <coughs> Dicosmus, uh, if I pronounced that wrong, I apologize for that. Then we got the Indian blanket. The Indian blanket uh, this year went um, like wild. It just blew, it grew everywhere, all right? Uh, we had so much that we were pulling off plants in, uh, during the, uh, while they were blooming because we just had to get around the, the garden and we have to make, make sure that we were able to get to it so we have to pull some of that out, as well as a cowpin daisy. We got the, the, it was the, the, the now the current now, fenced in area is called the meadow garden, and it's because um, it was just a, a nice and green, and before it was all dark, brown, and dry. And in one of the uh, biggest uh, plants that we realized wasn't there, was the glow mallow, which is this one right here. It grew up as much as uh, this high. So I, I could almost bury myself in it and not see it. Uh, so that, uh, that was interesting. Okay, uh, with the garden, you're going to have insects come in. Uh, on the uh, left side over here, you got the bumblebees. On the passion flower, you got the the red buds, uh, this is uh, the leaf cutters who did their little uh, uh, signature uh, craft. And then you had see, these uh, caterpillars on the cowpin daisy. I could not tell you what type of caterpillars or what butterflies will become from this particular uh, caterpillars. And then, uh, and obviously, you know, this is a pollinated garden, so I had to, we didn't have any pictures because we weren't. Uh, we didn't think we were going to have any presentations or we had to present to someone that this is before and after and so forth. This is progression from point A to point B to point C and so forth. But I did have to catch uh, one, one month, uh, some months back, a uh, queen butterfly on the Texas uh, milkweed. And as you can see, the Texas milkweed has the, the seed pods and the flowers still coming out. They're blooming. Well, right now, this is, uh, uh, we have established in, in this year uh, a path so that as the visitors would come in and want to look at the, the plants in the, on the backside of the garden, it would help them get closer instead of trying to maneuver through all the plants that were there so that they could actually see the names because each plant will have a name ta uh, tag in front of it. So you get to see, oh, that's where, what kind of plants is that? I don't know because I usually look at the name plants every time I even go there. So I've been there almost like three, four years now, and I still got to look at the, 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 the name plant, okay? Uh, so it's, uh, and then uh, EG already provided some, uh, some moats to put on, on, on that uh, path. And then there's a, there's a rock there in the center, and uh, it was decided uh, uh, that we're gonna utilize the rock to put some cactus on it, all right? Uh, so, uh, I had to put in. Oops, I had to put in right here these little rocks because because uh, it was uh, open. So I had to go find in my property some rocks that kind of matched the big rock uh, there, and uh, it was uh, it was pretty exciting for this for, for where I was concerned because I was making this little bed out of rocks and I didn't know how it was going to come out, and it utilized the purpose, you know, and having a purpose for the rock to sit there. And this part of the garden is also going to be used for. Uh, uh, more of uh, deer resistant plants that we don't have to worry about uh, putting behind the fence. And so and we talked about uh, the effect that cowpin daisy was there. Cowpin daisy in, in 21 uh, may produce a lot of seeds, so it migrated over to the uh, garden across the, uh, the sidewalk, and so that was great. And then, so the, the end result is uh, you know, the garden, we're utilizing. Our experience from the, the project leader who is the president of the NEPSOP and Curl chapter, uh, Nancy Huffman. And um, so, you know, you got parts of the garden that receive a lot of sun on the, the street side in the middle, where you saw that rock right there. And then there's the, the, the bottom side of that garden, there's a lot of American beauty, beauty berry, you got the, the, the Damianitas, you got the uh, Mealy Blue Sage, you got the, the, the Biba bush. And then uh, also we had to come up with some ways to put the plant names on something you could read them. So we used the bamboo 
to hold the plant name. So although, otherwise it'd be hard because like people say, oh, you got tall plants, you can't read down there, and they're in the, in the middle of tall plants. Uh, so with that being said, uh, we, uh, I'm here to ask, answer any questions that I can, okay? Uh, I'm not the expert, I'm a Texas master naturalist, and the reason I say this is because I just, when I became a Texas master naturalist, the, the mission statement is, is to provide uh, a core of well-informed volunteers, okay? <laughs> well-informed right? volunteers that provide education, outreach, and service dedicated to the beneficial management of natural resources, natural areas within their communities for the state of Texas. So with that, with uh, working with UGRA and Tara and her staff, gives me an opportunity to do that to provide what I'm doing right here. So thank you all for doing that. Thank you.